Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus again today. I am Trace, and this is episode three of three in our series about leaving Earth. So far, we've talked about how we find habitable planets and what plans are there for leaving Earth, and can we terraform a planet to fit our needs? Love that word, terraform, it's so cool. Today, though, we're gonna talk about, let's assume that we could leave Earth. What would it look like then? You know, who gets to leave? And what would the society that we set up somewhere else look like? Is it gonna look different than ours? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So make sure you subscribe so you get all of the episodes in this and our future series. Please join us here in this community on our channel. We've got all sorts of really great commenters. Thank you guys so much for commenting. This has been a really comment heavy series, which is awesome. And also make sure you come find us over on iTunes if you prefer audio podcasts or on SoundCloud now because now we're there too. It's so great. Thanks for asking us to get on there because it's awesome. All right, let's kick into it. What would human civilization on another planet look like, right? There isn't much research on evacuating Earth. That's not really a plan that people have. It's kind of conjecture, but it's fun to talk about. You know, I just wanted to start there. We're doing a lot of kind of guesswork here. Let's just say a few things need to happen a certain way, right? Earth has to be in immediate danger of destruction, and we somehow found a habitable planet that we could go to. So then who would get to go first? I mean... Obviously, you would want to go, whoever you are, lovely human, but chances are that's not going to be how it works. You know, you probably won't get to go, I probably won't get to go. People who will are powerful people, like politicians, but who should get to go first? Doctors, scientists, professors, astronauts? I mean, probably astronauts. They've been to space before, but who gets to go? The United Nations probably calls the shots on this plan about leaving Earth and colonizing New Earth. According to the UK Space Agency, who was responding to a series of freedom of information requests, they said that, quote, the United Nations have set out rules concerning visiting other bodies that may sustain life. These are set out in the Outer Space Treaty, which you may remember in 1960s Outer Space Treaty has a really long name. Anyway, then it went on a bit and it ended with that the UK would abide by a UN ruling. So the UK Space Agency kind of outed the UN and said, look, there is a plan. It's there. They also spoke of who would get preferred flights off of Earth, and their answer was, quote, first and foremost, astronauts would be able to leave Mother Earth. And later in their responses, they wrote that we need to look after our own planet as mass relocation is not possible. So we're screwed, basically. Astronauts get to go, and probably some other important scientists and people who are picked by somebody or other, likely in the UN. But overall, most of us are not going to get to leave. So we're just stuck here to deal with whatever's going on. If it's an asteroid coming to destroy the planet or global warming or, you know, we'd run out of food or whatever it is. So the question is, is that how every space agency would choose? especially now with private commercial space ventures. It'd be a huge business to fly people up into space so they could escape this disaster, whatever that would be. And what would happen to the rest of us? We're just here, hanging. Though all of this kind of depends on how long we have, too, right? Because there is kind of a futility if we were to have a disaster today in leaving Earth, because where are we going to go? Nowhere. Nowhere. There's nowhere we could go where we could survive forever. But if we have 10 years or 100 years or 1,000 years to plan for this, it might look very different. An evacuation plan would look vastly different in 100 years than it does today or in the next decade. We tried to find if the UN or any other governmental body did have a specific plan in place for something like a devastating asteroid. They don't really have anything like that uh, publicly that we could find. But the only thing that we could find were ways to prevent an impact, which you can check out. We talked about that in our asteroid series, so make sure you go uh, check in that. And then there's also no real evacuation plan to leave Earth. There's no actual plan that we could find. So let's take a look at something kind of similar, you know, kind of the shadows of what that might look like. The U.S. government does have a plan for a normal catastrophic event. They don't need to leave Earth 
but it's something like a nuclear war scenario where how we live our life today isn't going to be viable. It's called the Continuity of Government Plan, and it came around in the days of the Cold War, and details have been pretty secret for the most part, even from members of the House Homeland Security Committee. It's a 98-page strategy for mass evacuation and relocation of every federal government agency so that government in the United States could continue. This is all in the event of a catastrophic national emergency of some kind. Basically what happens is the president and his or her successor would set up a shadow government, which sounds kind of awesome, uh, but mainly they would just make sure that national essential functions would continue. Things like ensuring the three branches of government, state functional, providing leadership visibly to the nation during this difficult time, but also to the world to defend the constitution, you know, all of that stuff. So if we weren't given much notice for a catastrophic event, maybe the line of succession of the president would also have to come into play, right? Uh, and this is kind of interesting, the line of succession. You know, we have the president at the top, then we have the vice president, then you have the speaker of the house, the president pro tempore of the senate. There isn't always one of those. The secretary of state, the secretary of the treasury, then the secretary of defense, then the attorney general, then the secretary of the interior. They have a list of almost 20 people. After that, Maybe they have another list, but that's, that's it, according to the Presidential Succession Act of like 1947 or something. But if we were given 100 years, you know, if you had a century to plan, like in a century an asteroid will destroy the planet or the sun will explode. We know that today. There's nothing we can do to stop it. Would we all be able to leave the planet? Would we be able to, in 100 years, pull together and GTFO? GTFOP. Get the F off planet. Yeah. There are currently people volunteering for a one-way mission to Mars. You probably heard about that. And all they're trying to do is live there for a few decades, not forever. And it's called Mars One, and their selection process wants people who are resilient and adaptable and curious, including a bunch of other requirements, like physical requirements and such. But that's because it sucks. It's for a reality TV show, and the rest of life is a long time. They don't really know what they're doing, but that's fine. What got us thinking, though, about relocating to populate another planet. How do you maintain genetic diversity? How do you do all, what if you're living on Mars with a dozen people and one of the ladies gets pregnant and you're at capacity? Like you have a baby coming that's gonna be a child. You have to figure out what to do. What happens? You're living there, you know, out of contact. Or conversely, let's say you're living post-disaster and you need to repopulate. What happens then? How do you weed out people who are prone to diseases? Would we all need to be genetic perfections? Would you want people in your new population who have sickle cell anemia or who have genetic precursors to cancers or to other disorders? What about personal freedoms like birth controls and abortions? Are those allowed in this new society? All of these things would have to be addressed. And depending on what the society needed, these things could change. It's kind of insane to think about. We may ask more questions, by the way, in this series than we answer because there's not really a lot of answers, but it's also cool because we are curious about this too, and hopefully we'll go down into the comments and we can all talk about it because it's super interesting. There actually have been studies on how many people we would need aboard a generational spaceship to maintain a genetic diversity of a human population. In 2002, an anthropologist at the University of Florida calculated 150 passengers in a 2,000-year trip to another solar system could colonize a new world, assuming, of course, that you are very careful about who bred with who. doesn't sound particularly free. You know, you don't get to marry for love in this situation. You don't get to pick your partner because you have to worry about inbreeding. But larger groups tend to have, of course, a better chance at a larger gene pool, more genetic diversity, and that's good. A more recent 2014 study by an anthropologist from Portland State University named Cameron Smith, Cameron's estimate was much higher. A minimum of 10,000 people would be required to maintain genetic diversity. 10,000, and possibly even 40,000 to increase even more genetic diversity because lots of people are gonna die during this journey. You're not just gonna pop over to another planet, it's gonna be fine, especially in a generational starship situation. The study's super in-depth, you can check it out, we put the link down in the description. According to Smith, with 10,000 people, you can set off with a good amount of genetic human diversity all built in. Then you can survive maybe a disaster, like a bad disease sweep. You can arrive in numbers and diversity sufficient to make a good go at Humanity 2.0. 
we better hope for the century mark if this disaster is going to be real, because that's not really possible at the moment. A minimum of 10,000 people. Right now, the entire International Space Station is about the size of a five-bedroom house, and it can hold six people. Six. And we can only lift a few of them at a time to get there and back, right? The new heavy launch vehicle from NASA, which has the Orion capsule on it, that can lift four people to Mars. It's not the other side of the galaxy. It's not the other side of it. It's not even another solar system. Four people. We need to go, like, at the big estimate, 10,000 times bigger than that. That's insane and also impossible. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, because otherwise this episode would be over right now, that we did it. We figured it out. We got everybody off the planet that we needed to get or that we could get, and we colonized Mars. So Earth is hit by something or destroyed somehow, and we go colonize Mars. What would the government look like on Mars? What would society look like? Or if Earth wasn't destroyed and we just went and colonized Mars, how would Earth-Martian relations work? Would we be in an independent Martian government? According to the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, no nation can claim territory in space. You can't own a celestial body, and no nation can say, this is now mine because I put my flag here. There is no law, however, against ruling a colony on Mars. But many experts think that it should be completely independent of Earth, and it should set up its own government and so on and so forth. Mr. Elon Musk thinks a democracy would be a good idea. Good one, Mr. Musk. At a conference, he said he was in favor of a direct democracy over a representative democracy. People could vote for their leaders as well as policies and laws to avoid corruption. But what happens to humans through several generations of space flight and then several more generations? You know, if we colonize Mars and then people live on Mars and they have kids and then their kids live on Mars and then they have kids and their kids live on Mars, that first generation is long gone. The ones that left Earth, they're dead. So in living memory, we would have no human who's been to Earth. What does that society look like? I hope some of you watched Battlestar Galactica, the remake one, because it was amazing. They had this militarization situation of the small populace. I think they had something like 40,000 people at one point, and everybody had a job, and the mission was long. Who knew how long? And people were separated in different ships by class and vocation. You know, you have a kid, and you're an engineer, then when you die, your kid takes over your engineering job because who knows how long we're gonna be out here and we need engineers. What if you're a cook or a fighter pilot or the president? Does your kid get to take over? What kind of a society is that? That you don't get those choices. This is the problem with setting up a whole new society. There is a group of people who are thinking about this, the 100 Year Starship Project, so cool, look it up. Uh, it's headed up by an awesome woman named Mae Jemison. And she and all of these people in the 100 Year Starship Project are thinking about how to set up all these systems and what we would need to do to not only reach another star, but what we would do when we get there. It's super cool. On top of that, we would eventually evolve into this whole new species because we'd have a new environment. Like a long time, it would take a long time, generations. The same way that humans who migrated around the Earth diversified, people who migrate to other planets are going to diversify as well, but in a different way and way more extreme. On Earth, we consistently experience, for example, one G-force, the force of gravity from Earth. According to NASA, when you're in space, even just going to space a little ways away from Earth, astronauts can grow around two inches while they're, say, on the International Space Station. It's because your vertebrae expand, or the squishy bits between your vertebrae expand, and that causes you to get a little taller. And then they lose that when they come back down to Earth, usually in about two weeks, 10 days or so. But gravity on Mars, that's only a third of Earth's. So that first generation would feel super strong, but by the third or fifth generation, they would have adapted. They would have adapted to that that lifestyle. Not only would they maybe develop to be taller at first, their bone densities might change, and they would evolve to learn and live with this new normal. Right now, internal organs rely on gravity, and organ function becomes less efficient when not under gravity. Prolapsed organs, uh, which are organs that have moved around inside of your body and can become out of place, 
don't function as well and can cause a whole host of health problems. The esophagus, for example, relies very heavily on gravity as well as muscle movement. Blood flows differently when you're in space versus when you're on Earth, and if you're in a third gravity, that means blood is going to flow even differently there. It also pools differently. Astronauts in space have problems with their vision because the retina moves, and it's, it's weird, but they also have puffy face because their blood is puffed up and filling up parts of their face that would normally be held down by gravity. Which got me thinking, like, what if the first generation of Martians, like the people that just arrived from Earth, right, they think Earth people are super hot with their skinny little faces, right? The third and fifth generations, they probably don't think Earth people are hot anymore. Puffy face is hot, because that's what everybody is, and everybody they've ever known is. Super weird to think about, but that's how culture is formed. Whatever. There's also sun exposure. Mars is hit by a lot more of the sun's radiation. Of course, we could be in suits and indoors and under bubbles and things to prevent that radiation from getting to us. So our skin would most likely change color. It would either get darker or lighter. Our eyes would probably change as well. And according to an astronomy professor at the University of Arizona, Chris Impey, these people will become an offshoot of the human tree and will likely evolve into something else. That's so neat, right? They'll be Martians. I mean, they'll be humans, but they'll be Martians. That's so cool. Colonizing another planet in general is kind of a crazy idea. But if you think about it, and you try and step back from it, colonizing the New World or exploring the Pacific out of Asia, you know, humans have been doing this. This is the same thing. They had to sail some type of ship out of view of the thing that they knew, the thing they understood, to somewhere far, far away and figure out how to make a life with only what they brought with them. That's not unlike colonizing a new planet. The difference is when you got to Plymouth Rock, gravity was the same and the rock wasn't poisonous and covered in radiation. But whatever. It's still basically the same thing. And to be honest, a lot of people died, so there's that. Something to look forward to in human colonization. But once we figured it out, humanity was way better off. I mean, if we'd never sailed past the horizon, what would, what would happen to the planet? It would have been a whole different world out here. Thanks for watching this episode in this series on leaving Earth. If you really love space stuff as much as I do, go to the App Store and download this new uh, free app. It's called Discovery Go. You can watch my favorite space documentary that Discovery has ever done. It's called When We Left Earth. It's this amazing story about early NASA and it talks about astronaut selection and the Apollo program, it's so great. And if you're not into that, you can also check out other Discovery Channel shows, all of them. They're so great, like Deadliest Catch and Mythbusters and stuff. So there's a link in the description if you wanna check it out, it's super cool. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode this week. Let us know in the comments if you haven't gotten down there already, what you think about leaving Earth and if you have any other ideas for future episodes. And thank you so much for tuning in. You can also come find us over on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez. The show is at DNews. And you can tweet at us with the hashtag DNews Plus because that helps us sort it out. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.